We're lucky to be joined by the parish priest of St. George and St. Anthony's Coptic Orthodox Church in Ottawa, Canada. So Father Anthony Murad is an expert, he's an expert at answering difficult questions and providing great explanations for complex questions. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um, do I have permission to share screen? If I can get that, that would be wonderful. And then we'll jump into the second part of the conversation by God's grace. All right, here we go. Okay, so can somebody just give me a, a thumbs up just to let me know that you can see my screen? Okay, wonderful. Here we go. So for the second part of the conversation, if, if you guys have been paying attention specifically to what it is that Dr. George has been walking us through, um, there's a tremendous amount of evidence for us to really believe what it is that is written in the Holy Scriptures, for us to believe that truly that the Bible really is given to us as the Word of God that is meant to shape us, that is meant to reveal to us the truth of who our Lord, our God is, to reveal to us the message of salvation, and there's so much going on there. But one thing that we hear so much, especially from a lot of young men and women like you guys, especially in confession, is how do I apply these things into my life? How do I just read the Bible and then make it into something that I live? And it's not just stories that I read about. And some people will come and talk about how it is that they sometimes find it boring to read the same things over and over again. And they don't like reading certain books and they prefer other books. And there's a lot of comments that are given. And today, over the next 20 minutes or so, I want to be able to share with all of you guys some of the practical things that I think that the church has taught us in order for us to be able to really live what it is that we read in the Bible. It's not enough for us to read the Bible and to memorize the stories. It's not enough for us to memorize the verses. It's not enough for us to remember certain things historically, because it's also written in the Bible in in the epistles of St. James, that even the demons are aware of what is in the Bible, but it doesn't change them. We don't want to study the Bible the same way we study any other book. To study the Bible simply to retain data is not enough. We have to treat the Bible as if it was really what it is that is allowing us to access the very life that God wants us to live, that it is our passageway into entering into relationship with the Holy Trinity. So if you'll allow me in this next segment, over these next 15 to 20 minutes, I want to discuss a little bit with you guys how it is that we can dare to apply some of these things that we read in the Bible. That how it is that no matter what we read, no matter what verses we come across, and, and, and I think in Sayyidina's original introduction, he set it beautifully to give us an idea of how it is that the Bible is filled with songs and poetry and history written by judges and kings and prophets. And, and there's so much that is happening in the Bible that it's so important for us to be able to read every verse and to ask ourselves, Lord, what do you want me to take away from this? So it's not enough for us to read and to not apply. There has to be some sort of application. Now, let me confess something to all of you. Let me confess something that I used to struggle with. My father of confession used to always tell me when I was younger, you have to read your Bible every single day. As a matter of fact, he used to tell me the day that you don't read your Bible, that day doesn't even count in your life. So he used to try to tell me what you must read your Bible every single day to make sure that that day actually counts. So sometimes I'd come back home. Now, remember, this is just our little secret. OK, this is me confessing to all of you publicly of things that I used to do and that God is helping me get better at. OK, I used to get home and then realize, oh, my goodness, the day is already gone. I finished everything I had to do. And now I'm so tired and I haven't read the Bible yet. So what do I do? I sit on the edge of my bed. And I crack open my Bible and then I realize, okay, let's, let's, let's read a chapter. So what's the first thing I do? And this is a big mistake. And I'm telling you the mistakes I used to do so that you don't do it. First thing I would do is go take a look at how many verses there are in that chapter. And then I would say, oh my goodness, I still have to read 35 verses. And this is going to be so long and so difficult. And how am I going to do this? And I would already set myself up to fail. Why? Because the, the way that I was approaching the Bible is I just need to get it done. You know, I used to read the Bible the same way that I used to brush my teeth. And this is a problem. I, I used to hate brushing my teeth. And I used to hate having to brush my teeth before I go to bed. But I was always told you have to do it. And so here I was now sitting down, reading the Bible and thinking to myself, Yalla, khalas, just get it done. But, but where is the benefit in that? 
where is the benefit in making the mistake of saying, yalla, just get it done. Or to think to myself, just put the check mark next to it so you can say, A plus, I got it done. So I can, when I sit on my father of confession, I can tell him, Abuna, you'll be proud of me. I read it every single day. But what is there to be proud of? What is there to be proud of if all I'm going to do is simply read for the sake of reading without trying to find out how it is that the Lord wants me to be transformed from what it is that I am reading? And this is where I think the message that Abuna Antony so beautifully um, placed for us in this very specific message. He said, we must dare to apply. And I want to give you guys three very basic very basic steps that I think the church has taught us over so many years in order for us to be able to understand how it is that we can benefit and truly apply the words of Holy Scripture to our lives. Number one, in everything that you read in the Bible, search for him. Search for the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that you read. If you're reading the Old Testament, if you're reading the New Testament, if you're reading the Psalms, if you're reading Proverbs, if you're reading Judges, histories, prophecies, uh, the epistles, revelation, whatever you are reading, search for him. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that sometimes I think we read the Bible and we forget that everything in scripture is given to us by the church and everything points to who? To the person of Jesus Christ, to our Lord, our God, and our Savior. Everything points to him. So if I'm reading a few chapters in the Old Testament, I must ask myself, where is he in all of this? How does this point to him? What am I supposed to take from this? How is it slowly revealing to me something about the person that I'm in relationship with? This person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example of this so it can be clear. I want to give you an example from the book of Song of Solomon. Now, the book of Song of Solomon is this beautiful book from the Old Testament that is written by King Solomon, and it's a book of poetry. Whether or not it's historically accurate, we don't know, and it doesn't really matter because we do know what it points to. And it points to the relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, and his beloved, which is the church, which is every single soul every single human being. So I'm going to read to you this passage in Song of Solomon chapter 6, so you can see how it is that we can see him in these passages, how we can find him in everything that we read, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New Testament. So in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, what does it say? My beloved has gone to his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Now, if I'm reading this carelessly, I might think to myself, okay, well, you know, the actual book of Song of Solomon, it's a story about this master who ends up, you know, falling in love with the Shulamite girl, and she's from the villages, and she's just a poor girl, and he falls in love with her, and they're chasing each other. But that's exactly the story between me and the Lord. That's exactly the relationship that I have between me and God. So when I start to apply this first step of searching for Jesus in every verse, what do I realize? The beloved that the Shulamite is speaking of is who? Is my beloved. This is the person of Jesus. This is the person of Jesus. And, and my response to him is to say that I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. When you do this, you will begin to see the beauty in so many beautiful things in the Old Testament. Now, it's easy to do this in the New Testament because we're always talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, you'll begin to see so many beautiful types, types of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we mean by types? Whenever the church speaks of typography or types, what we're saying is that these people point to the person of Jesus. For instance, Jonah in the belly of the whale, like the Lord Jesus Christ. We take a look at the person of Joshua, whose name, by the way, Joshua and Yeshua, which is Jesus, right? It's actually the same name, just spelled slightly differently in the Hebraic culture. Joshua is also a type of Jesus. Joseph is also a type of Jesus. Jacob is also a type of Jesus. And we see so many people point to the person of Jesus. Then there's the prophecies and there's these beautiful songs that speak of the Lord and the relationship that we are with him. If in every verse that I read, I'm always searching for him, then I will find something that is meaningful to me. The second thing I want to invite you to do is always place yourself 
in the context of what you're reading. Always place yourself. It's not enough for you to read it as if you are outside of the story, as if you were outside and just looking in. I want you to place yourself in everything that you read. And what's beautiful about our church is that you will realize that no matter how many times, how many times you have read the same passage over and over again, there is always something new that we can learn from it. You know, when I first became a priest, I used to think to myself, you know, what am, what am I going to give a sermon on every year when it's the same stuff that we give sermons on? You know, how are we always going to speak about the same things? You know, and I am looking at a person like our beloved elder, His Grace, uh, Bishop Daniel, who, you know, Sayyidna has been in the clerical ranks now for many years, and I am sure he has spoken about so many passages in the Bible over and over and over again, whether it be the blessing of the five loaves of the two fish, or Jesus Christ with the Samaritan woman, or the healing of the blind man, or the resurrection, or the nativity, or theophany, all of these passages, you begin to think there's nothing new to talk about, but that is not true. Every single time we place ourselves in all of these passages, the Holy Spirit reveals to us something so beautiful and so new and so meaningful to our lives. Let me give you a very basic example. Look at the example of the prodigal son. There are times in my life where I will read the, the parable of the prodigal son that is spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of St. Luke. And sometimes I will feel like I am the son. I am the prodigal. I am the one who has betrayed my father. I am the one who needs to say, I will arise and go back to my father and say, I have sinned against heaven and on earth and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. There is another part in my life where when I read it, the Holy Spirit will tell me, you know what? You're actually more like the older brother. And when I place myself in that story, I will realize I'm the one who is bitter. I am the one who's hypocritical. I am the one who is angry. I am the one who is unforgiving. I am the one who has been in my father's house, but I have no relationship with my father. Another time when I place myself in the same story, the Lord might be telling me, be like the father. Be patient, be forgiving, be welcoming, be loving, be compassionate. What's beautiful about the gospels, what's beautiful about when we read the scripture is that whenever we place ourselves in every story, there is always something so beautiful to learn. We are the Samaritan woman. We are the man born blind. We are the paralytic. We are that one sheep that was lost. We are even the 99. We are anything and everything in every story. But our prayer has to be, Lord, show me who it is that I am today. What is the message that you want to give me? So let's remember, there's two very basic things that we just discussed. We said, number one, Search for Jesus in every passage. Search for Jesus in every passage. And the second thing that we can do to help us apply is to always place ourselves in everything that we read, in every context, in every story, in every character. The third and last thing I'm going to share with you in a way for us to be able to apply the Bible to our lives is very basic, but believe me, sometimes we don't do it. I really want to invite you to believe that everything that is written is true. Believe that it is truth. You know why I say that? <laughs> because sometimes I have caught myself in my own life saying that, yeah, yeah, I believe the Bible. And then turning around and not applying it. Let me give you an example of this. You know, uh, Dr. George was just giving us an example of people saying, oh, I don't believe that Moses crossed the Red Sea, or I don't believe that Jonah was swallowed by the whale. I'm not even talking about those things. Those things I know that the Lord has explanations for, and that there are some things that are beyond my understanding because the Lord works in miraculous and mysterious ways. But there's other stuff that I really need to start believing. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. Do I believe that the Lord Jesus actually said, love your enemies? Yeah, I, I believe it. It's written. I can probably pull it up for you. But do I live it? Do I believe that he actually meant it? Do I actually hold myself accountable? Do I believe that there is a verse that says, honor your father and your mother for the days of your life will be prolonged? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe that there's a verse that says that. But do I believe it as if it were truth? Do I believe in the blessing? 
do I realize how important this commandment is? Or do I like to pick and choose what I like from the Bible? Have you ever heard of something called cafeteria Christianity? You know what cafeteria Christianity is? It's a very scary thing. Cafeteria Christianity is based on this idea of cafeteria style fooderies. What is a cafeteria style foodery? It's also known as an open buffet. If ever you've been to any of these restaurants before, what you do is that you walk in and you have these plates that are empty and then you walk aisle by aisle and there's tons of food and you get to pick and choose what you like, right? There's tons of food and you fill your plate and you go eat and then you come back and you fill your plate again. So, you know, what do you do in those situations? You walk down, you say, oh, I want some egg rolls and you put some egg rolls. I want some steak. I want some chicken nuggets. I want some fries. Then you come across the broccoli and you're like, ah, I don't want the broccoli. I don't want the vegetables. I don't want the salad. I'm only going to take what I want, right? This is how we typically behave in a cafeteria style eatery. Imagine people who do the same thing when it comes to Christianity. Cafeteria style Christianity are the people who say, oh, I like this commandment, do not murder. You know why I like do not murder? Because I don't like being murdered. So because I don't want to be murdered and I have no intention on murdering anyone, that's a good one. Let's keep that one. I'll put that one in my plate. What's another one? Oh, do not steal. Yeah, I like do not steal. I have no intention on stealing. I think it protects me. Let me put that one in my plate. Turn the other cheek. Um, I don't know about turn the other cheek. I mean, what if the other person really deserves it? What if the person really like provokes me? What if the other person needs someone to stand up to? Uh, let's leave that one. I'm not interested. Let's not put that in my plate. Honor your father and your mother. Sure, I'll honor them as long as they don't bother me because the moment that they bother me, you know, maybe I'll have a strong opinion. Maybe I'll have a reaction. Let's not put that one in my plate. That's not how it works. Halid. That's not how it works. St. Augustine, he says something very powerful. He says, if you pick and choose what you like in the Bible, it is not scripture that you believe in, but yourself. Let me repeat that. If you pick and choose what you like in the Bible, it is not scripture that you believe in, but yourself. I am not interested in following me. I am interested in following Christ which means that I have to believe that everything that is written in the Bible was meant for me, and I have to behave as if it were truth. So, example, imagine reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and actually living as if it were true. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Imagine if I lived a life where I didn't just know this, but I actually lived accordingly. Imagine a life where I actually believed what it meant when Jesus said the words, pick up your cross and follow me. Imagine what it means for me to believe when the Lord Jesus looks at me and he says, follow me, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. Maybe this is not craziness. And I say that it's not craziness because we have two wonderful examples right in the front of us. Please take a look at your screen right now. We have a person like His Grace and we have a person like Father, Father Anthony who both heard these verses Maybe Sayyidna more than Father Anthony, because Father Anthony, Sayyidna is our father. Father Anthony, I'm only mentioning him because he's in the camera picture, but Sayyidna is a real example. <laughs> we have to be people who take this seriously. We have to be people who read the Bible and say, this is real. It's not fake. It's not poetic. It's not romantic. It's not exaggerated. This is what leads to real life. So my beloved, when you read the Bible, I urge you, ask yourself, if Jesus really meant this, how do I apply it as truth in my life? Those are the three things I want you to go away with today. I want you to remember that you must look for him in every verse, that you must place yourself in every story, in every context, and that you must believe everything as if it were truth. Believe everything as if it were truth. If we begin by doing this, as we read the Bible daily, then the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal to us what it is that the Lord is calling each and every single one of us to. To God be all glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.
Thank you so much, Ubuna. That was an amazing talk. Now, once again, we're getting flooded by tons of questions, but I'm just going to ask you two, if that's all right. Sure. All right. Now, the first question we got is, how can I enjoy reading and benefit from some of the Old Testament books? For example, Numbers or Maccabees? <laughs> very, those are two very interesting examples. So Numbers, Numbers is a tough one. I won't lie, Numbers is a tough one, and Numbers is one of the books in the Old Testament that there is so much symbolism and so much beauty. If you've ever had a chance to be able to read, for instance, some of the commentaries of Father Tadgos Malati, who has done a wonderful job in giving so many beautiful commentaries on the Old Testament books, it gives a tremendous amount of explanations. But yes, you know, I have to tell you, as young men and women, I would probably encourage you to read Numbers at least once, right? And then you can focus your attention and studying other books. The book of Maccabees, actually, it's interesting that you bring that up because I love the book of Maccabees. I'm a, I love action, you know? And, and you know that video that Abuna showed us in the beginning of The Matrix? I'm very familiar with that video because I watched, I watched it once upon a time. Um, but like the book of Joshua that is filled with wars and the book of Maccabees that talks about strategy and fighting and how they conquered. And there's so much interesting things that are happening there. So I really think it does depend on where, you're at, where you are in your life, what stage you are in. And this is where I think the best advice I can give you is that to read the Bible on your own is foolish. You have to make sure that you are speaking to your father of confession. You have to have a spiritual guide. Habibi, as Orthodox Christians, we don't believe in this whole, I'm going to get to heaven by myself stuff. That stuff is fake. That stuff is foolish. Nobody gets to heaven alone. All of us have to be discipled. All of us have to have an Abba. You know what an Abba is? You know, if, if you ask our fathers, the monks, they will tell you that their entire life, their entire tradition is, is hinged on this idea of having an elder, an Abba who teaches us. We have the privilege of being part of the Orthodox tradition where we believe in discipleship. So speak to your spiritual elder. Speak to the person who is counseling you. Tell them, listen, I get bored easily when it comes to this, this, and this. And they might tell you, okay, for now, focus on the Gospels. They might tell you, you know what? Go read the book of Proverbs, a book of poetry. Go book, read the book of Sirach or the book of Wisdom. Or they might tell you, you know what? Go all the way back to the beginning. Read the book of Genesis. And your father of confession might give you, you know, a canon that allows you to jump around from old and new, sometimes from here, sometimes from there in order to keep you engaged and loving the scripture. You do not have to read the Bible from cover to cover as if it was chronological. You don't have to do it that way. If your father of confession thinks that's what's best for you, great. If your father of confession gives you a different uh, prescription, if you wish, then again, that's because your father of confession knows you best. So I would suggest make sure that you are speaking to your father of confession regularly so they can help cater for you or personalize a very specific reading program. Thank you for that, Abuna. Now, the second question is, how can I hear God while I read the Bible? I have to tell you, in all honesty, Monica, it's not as complicated as we think. The best way for us to actually hear the voice of God when we're reading the Bible is to do two things, to ask in order for him to speak, and two, to pay attention. You know what we do? We have a tendency of reading the Bible the way that I told you I used to read it, right? This problem of just reading it to be able to read it and get it done with, right? Or another thing that we do, which is a big, big mistake, is you know how some people do this? Oh, Lord, let me know if I'm going to uh, win the lottery, okay? And then I pick up the Bible and I do this thing. You guys know, you know this thing? Uh, and then I open a random page and then I go, mm, and then I, I, I try to find the right verse. And then I say, okay, the Lord has spoken to me. Habibi, that's not the way God works. God is not working with us in those ways where you get to pick a random page and you get to place your finger anywhere and you say, you know, we're going to find out magically what God thinks of us. Maybe if you want to hear his voice, you must run after him. You must ask him to speak and you must search out for his voice. So as you're reading the Bible, tell him, Lord, reveal to me the message that you want to give to me today. And it's okay for God to tell you, listen, I'm not going to give it to you today. Baba Shnuda used to always say something very beautiful. He says, when we ask God questions, he gives us one of three answers. He will either say yes, no, or not now. Yes, no, or not now. And it's okay for me to ask God to reveal his will to me, to read today, maybe not get it. And he'll tell me, wait, wait a little bit longer. I'm preparing a better answer for you. 
and then I read tomorrow and I might not get it. I read a third day and a fourth day until finally it's as clear as day and God reveals to me what it is that I needed to hear in order for me to find him. Thank you for that. Abuna, I really loved your uh, food analogy, Abuna. It uh, really woke me up, Yanni. It's, uh, it's uh, eight o'clock here in uh, Australia, and that's what I wanted to hear, uh, something about food, you know? <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, uh, we are, you and me are of the same mind. <laughs> Abuna, uh, Abuna Anthony. Sayedna. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we are. I'm so happy to have met you now on the screen, but I, I really love you. And I love your way of uh, speaking. Thank you so much, Sayedna. I, I'm so fortunate to be your son and to receive your blessing. Please remember me in your prayers, dear Sayedna. Uh, no, no comparison of what I said. No, no, I'm no sorry, comparison. Sayedna, I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said. I, I, I said there was a big difference between uh, you and Anthony. And the one next to me and Anthony, too. <laughs> 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 all, all of your children are beautiful. Look, look at what he's doing, <laughs> Abuya, by, the, by the grace of God, hundreds of kids are, are benefiting. Thank you to your service and to your children, Abuya. Uh, Abuna, I've got a question for you, Abuna, and I see this in your retreat house a lot. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, body posture, right? a lot, I see a lot of people lying down in bed, you know, holding the book, you know, holding the book like this, or um, uh, and they say, um, isn't it better to read it while I'm comfortable rather than I have to sit down or stand up, or uh, you know, isn't yeah. it better to be comfortable reading the Bible rather than um, you know just not being uncomfortable? Uh, I think you ask a good question, Abuna, and, and, and I think it's important for us to remember who it is that we are standing up in the front of. And, and I think this is of extreme importance. You know, our posture says a lot about what we believe is happening in the moment. You know, until today, if the Queen of England walks into a room, everybody has to stand up. If His Holiness, the Patriarch, enters into a room, everybody will stand up and before greeting, his holiness, or even any of our fathers, the bishops, everyone will do a matanya and then greet them by kissing their hands and honoring them. Whenever we enter into the presence of God, we are also expected to enter into reverence. If you really did believe that this was the word of God, if we really believed that it was the Holy Spirit who was speaking to us in those moments, would we read it underneath the covers? Would we read it lying down? Would we allow ourselves to come into the very presence of God while neglecting the importance of realizing that he is in my presence? Now, now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not suggesting that every time we read that we are standing up and that we're wearing a shirt and a tie and that we're all fully any. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. But by all means, please make sure that you are in a posture where you are ready to receive this grace. You must be in a posture that promotes this idea of reverence. You must be in a posture that promotes your attention so you can focus. And you must be in a posture where you are also showing respect for the fact that you have requested to hear the voice of God and you believe that you will receive it. And so this is where I suggest that if you can, always make sure that you are sitting up straight, that you are fully focused, and that you are in a posture that allows you to be fully attentive to the word of God that you are receiving. Um, Father Anthony, I'm not sure what you think of that answer, but please, by all means, supplement it as you see fit. Perfect, Abuna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abuna. Actually, uh, one of one of the church fathers says that, um, um, like, if your body is aching while you're standing or sitting, that's uh, that's your body praising God. That's you know your, <laughs> the way your body praises yes. God. So, so yes. that's a good theory. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Abuna, I, I've, 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 I was told by. I was told by uh, another spiritual elder who loves St. Isaac the Syrian specifically. Um, he, he was telling me, whenever you start to feel that pain in your knees or in your back or on your feet from standing too long, um, this is a moment for you to be able to turn to God and to say, Lord, even this pain I offer to you. Even this moment I offer it to you. And this is our chance of exactly like you said, Abuya, uh, in order for us to be able to tell God everything in me, whether it be the pain or the joy, all of it, I, I, I surrender to you. I give it to you as an offering. 